you went out in Kimono, took a few pictures and later you looked at those pictures and you thought, why does my Kitsuke suck this much? In this video, I'm going to address the most common mistakes in kimono dressing, at least the mistakes that I very often see on Instagram and kimono forums. And I will also tell you how to fix those mistakes. Let's get started. In case you're here for the first time, my name is Billy Matsunaga and I'm a fully trained and certified kimono teacher and stylist. And yes, learning how to dress yourself in a kimono takes a lot of time and there's a lot of skills you will have to learn. It is basically like learning a new language or learning a new instrument or trying a new sport, like for example, figure skating. It really takes long to actually master this. Anyway, what I wanted to say with this is some of you will fix their issues with just with watching this video and then trying the stuff I'm gonna show you. And some of you, it will take a lot of more work to actually really fix those tiny issues and bad habits you actually have built up in your kimono dressing. For this video, I have put together the most common mistakes and bad habits that I see on Instagram and on other kimono forums. Keep in mind that all of those issues might be also very individual and also always according to the size of your kimono. This is just one way to try how to fix it. So if you still have those issues, I can seriously only recommend taking a lesson with me. Link is down below on my homepage. We are going to work our way from bottom and then slowly up and we're going to talk about the different parts of a kimono that should be really straight and nice to make it the overall look of your kitsuke actually better. And the first issue is actually the hem. What I see very, very often is that the hem is way too high up and actually in Japanese we refer to this as the hem is too short so that's what I tend to say your hem is too short you can see when the hem is actually too short it looks really really unbalanced in kimono it is really important that you don't show your ankles and the actually length you want to have for your hem is either touching the floor or minus one centimeter from that. I personally do change how I dress myself with length of hem. I'm gonna give you two examples. When I go minus one centimeter from the floor is when I know I'm gonna go out somewhere and I'm going to take off my zodi. When I know I'm gonna enter a house or probably a store that has tatami on it, I am wearing it a tiny bit shorter so my hem doesn't drag over floors. It's only gonna make your hem dirty and you actually wanna avoid that. The days when I really want to make sure the hem is actually hitting the floor when I have the kimono on is when I go for formal occasions. These are also occasions where I more likely won't take my shoes off. I also really recommend doing this when you know that you're going to be on stage on that day. Keep in mind the people are sitting below you and they're gonna look up at you, which means your hem is even gonna look shorter just from their ankle. So really keep in mind to keep the hem hitting the floor. By the way, in most Japanese stages, you have to take off your zori when you get up. Not nah, most. I, in my life, it was like half of the stages I was on, I had to take my zori off. Even then, I really want to have the hem hitting the floor because people will think, huh, why is Billy's hem so short? Because it looks way shorter just from that ankle people are looking at me. So these are the two examples that I want you to keep in mind when dressing yourself. By the way, no worries. The hem is one of the hardest parts in actually playing with the hem, like having it hit the floor or having it not hitting the floor, having it only one centimeter from the floor. That takes practice, practice, practice and years of experience. 
First of all, I want you to practice to always have the hem hit the floor because that's actually the hardest thing to do. And you always first want to train yourself in the hardest thing to do. And then it's going to be easier to alter it to whatever you're going to do. So here is how to practice to have the hem hitting the floor. After setting the center back seam into the center and lifting the kimono, you let it slide down until the hem touches the floor. It's very important to first let slide down the back of the kimono. And when you feel it hit the floor, you straighten out your arms so the hem is completely straight. From my point of view, there should be no light peeking through from under the kimono and my feet are in complete shadow. Then you measure the top layer of the skirt. More on that in a few seconds. When bringing the right side to your left, let the hem wipe over the floor and lift it for about 10 cm when reaching your left hip bone. Remove wrinkles. When bringing the left to your right, let the hem wipe the floor and lift it after reaching the right hip bone. Now your hem should be perfectly on the floor. The next issue is actually one of my absolute pet peeves and is also one of the things I had already several discussions with some of my students because they just won't believe me. No worries, in the end they agreed with me, but I hate having those discussions. That is having the top layer of the kimono, the so-called uvamae, not covering up your front. When you want to properly cover up your front, the end of the collar should actually be on your side. But what I see very, very often is that the end of the collar is on the front. It just looks so, so, so messy. And it's proof that the kimono doesn't fit at all. You should at least try to look like the kimono fits you, even though it doesn't. There are some tricks to work with too small kimono and having actually properly the front covered up is one of those tricks. It is really important to bring the collar over all the way. When you have the collar placed as it is supposed to be and I put my hand on it, you can see that my hand is lying on the side. You can basically only see two fingers on the front. When you compare it with the wrong collar placement, you can see four fingers on the front and that is obviously too much. When you dress yourself and you measure the front skirt, the left side or the so-called uvamae, it is important to bring it all over before you move on in your dressing process. I know when the kimono doesn't fit you, this is going to shift with your seams. This will also shift your center back seam. And I know that there is this common belief that the center back seam has to be centered from top to bottom. That's by the way not true because it's simply impossible, especially when you wear a lot of recycled kimono that do not necessarily have your size. If you really want to have the center back seam being centered from top to bottom, you should really invest and look for kimono that actually fit you on front width and back width. I have a whole video about how to measure and calculate your sizes. I'm going to link it up here so you can check that out. The next part that is going to make your kimono outfit really, really, really messy is the ohashuri. And we're gonna stay on the ohashuri for a few more moments because the ohashuri is really really hard to straighten out and make nice and this is again gonna take you a lot of practice. One of the most common issues I see either having the ohashuri way too long or having the ohashuri way too short. Both is not really good. When you ask for the perfect length of ohashuri, it's usually something between 7 and 10 centimeter. Just 7 and 10 centimeter 
is like three centimeter difference. That is a lot in between. It depends on your body shape. So when you take a lesson with me, for example, I am not going to tell you in the first few lessons because you're gonna be overwhelmed already. At one point in your kimono journey, I will be able to tell you this is actually a good ohashiri length for you. This is how long I want to see the ohashiri on you. Having the ohashiri too long is one of the issues that can be fixed the most easily. We have first the case that the kimono actually fits you, which means the kimono is as long as you are tall from head to floor. This is how long the kimono is. And when you have a kimono in that length, one of the issues that makes your hashuri too long is that your hem is too short. So when you first fix your hem issue, you probably rather want to have less ohashuri issues. Another issue that makes the ohashuri actually too long is that your koshi himo, the first tie you tie around your kind of hip area, you're placing it too low for the kimono. Especially when the kimono has your size, you want to place that tie rather on your belly button height. So it's already going a tiny bit up into your waist. You don't really place this onto your hips. Let's tackle the ohashuri is too short. When your ohashuri actually is too short, one of the biggest issues is I don't think the kimono has your size. When the hem is actually hitting the floor and you want to place the tie where it just told you where to place it and then you don't have an ohashuri or a long enough ohashuri means the kimono is too short for you. It depends on how short if we can fix this issue or not. But keep in mind that placing the koshi himo lower in that case is a way to fix it. So when I wear a rather shorter kimono that is on the too short side for me, I am placing my koshi himo exactly on my hip bone. And then when you cover it up, you have an ohashuri. The next issue you might have with your ohashuri just being it really uneven, like I have a lot of people saying I have this kind of flap here on my right side, I don't know how to fix it. What you're doing wrong in this case is that you don't have the tie actually holding your end of the collar in place. Always keep in mind your end of collar, your erisaki, has to be held down. Really make sure that the tie is always holding this part of the kimono down. And this is fixing this issue right away. In general, when the ohashuri is kind of wrinkly, bubbly, wobbly, bulky, it's just not looking good. It will really take long and a lot of practice to actually straighten the ohashuri completely out. Here is how I do it. So you have the koshi himo on now, and now we're getting into the ohashuri. So you put both index fingers under the tie on the back and slide to the side to remove wrinkles and also make sure that the ohashuri is not caught under your tie. And then you go to your right side, make sure that the erisaki is straight and without wrinkles and also tucked under the tie. You go with your right hand under the tie and lower this. So it's just a tiny bit slanted on the front. Then both hands go into the ohashuri, fold down, one, two, slide to the front and fold down on the front, one, two. We're gonna skip a step that I usually do here. Pull your right hand out, let your left hand go all the way to the right behind both layers and your right hand goes into the top layer here through the collar all the way to the left. So your hands are crossed, they're reversed. That's why I call it cross slide. And then you slide to each other side. And one last time with your right hand from left to right, let your fingertips form the ohashuri. For the next part of this, I'm going to use a cording belt, which is an elastic belt with two clips on the side. The reason why I want to use this is it is easier to understand what is going on now because we will have to make the ohashuri single layered. And for a lot of people that doesn't make a lot of sense. Keep in mind that these coding belts are at least how I teach it, like training wheels on your bicycle. It will help you a lot to understand different things, to get an idea of different things without having to struggle with a tie. 
which means as a beginner you get a clearer and neater and nicer outcome way earlier. With the color steps, I don't want to go into too much detail how to do the color in uh, this video because then it would be a full how to dress kimono tutorial. So I have the clip here now on my right corner on the inside. You cannot see it because it is here. <laughs> And then you have a lot of fabric under the clip. You should be able to feel that there is still fabric under the clip. And you're going to fold that straight up behind the left hand. It's where you fold this up and slide straight out to the right. When you str slide straight out, you're gonna create this tuck here on the side. You just wanna keep it. This is not I'm going, something I'm going into detail today. Hold your left, uh, your right hand on top to hold everything in place. Pull the belt out, give it to your right side. Gonna make sure the tuck is still there. And we're gonna finish off the collar. And that is the Ohashuri. Next up that I think is a really, really, really big issue that makes your whole kimono outfit really messy even though you have probably all the other parts right is the obiage i think i can rather forgive a messy obijime than a messy obiage it just draws too much attention on it i know the obiage takes a lot of practice but in case you're a soccer fan it's like a standard play in football, like a free kick or a corner. This is the thing that gives you the most points that very often can lead to a good goal. You seriously need to focus on that and really master it. It is practice, 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 practice. Arbeit, Arbeit, Arbeit. Arbeit. I don't know how many German people even get that reference. Luckily, the obiage can be practiced even over your just regular clothes. So you can put just an obiage on your coffee table or on your sofa. And when you have a few seconds, like when you watch a drama, and instead of looking in your phone when you get bored, rather take the obiage and practice the exact following steps. I'm going to use uh, this obiage here that makes really, really clear what I'm doing because it has one third stripes, one third dots, and then the other third is stripes again. So before you start over, you wanna make sure that your obiage is not twisted. And then you wanna fold one third in. You basically fold this down, and then you fold the other third up, like this. And then I want you to turn it so you have the center piece or what I very often call the pretty side on top. So you can see this here on top when you look down. And then you hold it like so and you break it like a Rittersport chocolate. I keep on holding this and I slide back with my hand that's attached to this shoulder to fold it down to the back. I personally like to let this rest in my elbow. No worries, it's gonna stay in place. And we're gonna do the same on the other side. So first of all, I'm gonna make sure it is not twisted. And then I fold one third down, one third up. Show myself the pretty side here on top. And I fold this again in half, like a little sport chocolate. And you stay in with the hand is attached to the shoulder and slide back to fold it down. Then you're going to put left over right, pull the left side through. Tighten the knot against your chest, not on your obita. Whatever obiage you have, unless it's a full shibori obiage, I want you to do this following step because this is going to make sure that the obiage is always pretty. And I put my left index finger here on the center of the knot to hold it, pull the right side, what I have here, my right hand straight, 
wrap this once around the knot and when you've done that it's not gonna move it's staying in the exact tightness you want to have it and you can be a tiny bit more free with playing around with your obiage. I usually say that you this width here on top should be around 5.5 to 6 centimeter width because when it's too narrow your shoulders are going to look huge when it's too wide it's again looking too unbalanced very often 5.5 centimeter to 6 centimeter is a good width here on top and then you wrap this layer around four fingers of your left hand and put the tail I call this tail between your index finger and thumb and you put the other side between your middle finger and index finger keep in mind to not let, let this hang loose here you really want to have all the fabric in the knot so you really put this in tight and then your free right hand grabs the tail and when you're a tiny bit more experienced you can also hold the loop that's around your left hand if not it's good enough to just hold the tail and then pull your left hand through and don't tighten right away the next biggest mistake you can do first you want to let this fall because the ends here have to face downwards and then I'm also going to make sure everything is straight and without wrinkles at this point and now I'm going to tighten and I never tighten all at once I am holding with my left hand pull with my right hand I hold with my right hand pull with my left hand and so on in case I see any wrinkles here coming up, I'm straightening this out again. If you take a lesson with me, we can talk about the obiage, but there is one general thing I want you to do, and that is putting the ends here into the obiage that is here folded in half. Take the ends and put it in. And when you put this in, don't spread it out. You want to keep it here on the front, right under your chest, especially for those of you who have a big chest. You want to have that volume in the obiage, so the obiage is actually there and your chest is not going to push it down into the obi. And same on the other side. I'm going to open this up and I put the end in. And then you always put the knot in first and you slide along the obita so the rest will slip in naturally. Make sure that my obidom is centered. And this is how you tie an obiage. One thing I really want to especially say about the obiage in the end is when you have a bad obiage day, it's basically like a bad hair day. Live with it. Don't be too perfectionist. Even with all those tiny fixes and mistakes I'm talking about in this video, it is really important to keep in mind, rather be dressed in max 30 minutes and look a tiny bit more on the messy side than trying to dress yourself in 90 minutes, hating all of it in the end, spending way too much time, being frustrated. It's just not worth it. Just live with it for that, for that day and just try to do it better next time. That's seriously what I really want you to keep in mind and that's what I teach all of my kimono students because it's gonna take all the fun out of kimono. Anyway, having that said, what is the next thing I want? Color. The last part we're gonna talk about is the color. This is another thing that a lot of students don't believe me until they took actually a lesson with me on it. I have students complaining that their collar always just doesn't really look nice. They always come with, my juban collar is fine, just the kimono collar is weird. You know, the issue is that your juban collar is the actual base for your kimono collar. So when your juban collar is weird, your kimono collar is weird. You cannot have a weird juban collar and then a nice kimono collar. That's just math that's not going to happen. It's like when you say one plus one is four. <laughs> It's not gonna happen. You really need to have proper technique on your juban to actually make the kimono collar look neat. Of course, there are tips and tricks I can give you for the kimono collar, but at this very point, I first really want you to focus on your juban and 
This is how I want you to practice with your juban. You already have your arms through the sleeves. Then you put the end of the collar together. Right hand is holding the end of your erishin. The left hand goes to the central back seam and pulls down. Left hand holds it back in place and right hand opens up the front collar. Take the right side with your right hand on the center of your waist. Lift and bring it to your left. Try to cover up your left chest. The left hand takes the left side on the center of your waist, lift and place it on your right elbow. Pull your right arm out. Place the tie under your chest, let it cross on the back and tie it on the front. Straighten out on the back by sliding with both index fingers under the tie to the side. Pull the juban down over your bum and pull it down on the front over your belly button. Now you have a proper juban collar. If you drew a line along the collar edges, you can see that you have this big triangle where the two sides of juban meet. This makes your kitsuke sturdy because the garment is holding itself in place. Keep that in mind. It's not the tie who holds the garment. The garment actually holds itself. In comparison, let's look at the wrong version. You see that you only have this little space of coverage and this causes your collar to shift around because the collar cannot hold itself. And that is also making the kimono collar shift. And that is the whole issue. One thing that you have to keep in mind with the juban is that this is a very delicate topic, just like the ohashuri. It takes a lot of practice, even more experience to deal with it. Oh, believe me, the Ohashuri is a joke next to how hard it can be to actually place the juban collar right. And that is because it really depends on what size is the juban, how is it tailored. It really depends on how the collar is sewed on and also heavily what your silhouette looks like. So actually the placement on the collar on the front changes a lot according to those three factors. So when you take lessons with me, I really, really teach you how you individually have to place your collar so it always looks good. But you will have to take a lesson with me for that because this is nothing I can put into a video because all of you are gonna have varying issues with it. If there was any advice in this video, feel free to tell me down below in the comments. I would be really happy to know what actually helped you out a lot. If you have any more questions, feel free to also comment down below or send me a message on Instagram. It could be that I cannot fix this issue in a message, but it gives me awareness of what people want to know. So I can probably make another video on it. Anyway, when you feel like sticking around on my channel, feel free to subscribe. I would be really happy to have you here. You can also share this video with your friends that would actually help me out a lot. And I'll see you in my next kimono adventure. Bye.